continue on in our series of the Holy Spirit, the first thing that came to my mind was like um, thinking of, of Exodus, right? When uh, Joseph, I mean, Gen- begins in Jezebel where Joseph goes down in, into Egypt and, you know, he becomes like the second in command. And then it said over time that, that the Egyptians and Pharaoh forgot about who Joseph was. And so then they started to afflict the Hebrews and the, the more they afflicted the Hebrews, the more they grew, right? And that's, I mean, that's actually a biblical truth because there's, there's a lot of it you can actually see in today and age. Like if, uh, the church in, in China, that there was so much affliction taking place and, and just the growth that took place. So usually when there's affliction, growth takes place. It's something that's supernatural that happens. And some of us maybe have been going through some affliction, times of affliction and seeking comfort from, uh, from someone else. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. Amen. We're going to continue on in our series, like I said this morning. So we're going to read, we're going to read one verse this morning, um, and then I'll pray and we'll get into it. But it's going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. It's actually the, the very last verse of the entire book of 2 Corinthians. <coughs> We have it up on the screen, but hopefully you brought your Bibles. I'm going to kind of, there's going to be a, a point where just like kind of go through the Bible a little bit, um, read, read a couple of verses. We're going to kind of get into some little things um, this morning. So if you have it, you have your phone, maybe um, just keep that out. We'll be able to take time to, to kind of go through the Bible this morning for a, for a little section. So let me just read it this morning. It says, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. And he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let me read it one more time in case we missed anything. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for all that you have already done in this place. We thank you for allowing us to, to, uh, to see you in a new light, maybe, during our time of worship and, and being able to see the different words that are up on the screen declaring the name of Jesus. We thank you again for that freedom that is only brought through your Son, our Savior and Lord, by declaring his name over situations. So we thank you for the powerful name of Jesus in our life. And we just ask that you would use me today to speak what you've given me to speak, Lord. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would make it applicable to our lives. We thank you. We just set our awareness and our focus and our attention upon you, Holy Spirit. And we just ask that you would have your way. Anoint me for your good work, God, today. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know if you guys can remember when you guys were a, a kid. It, it might be a long time ago for some of you guys here. But um, <laughs> that was messed up, right? Thought I'd throw in a little jab really quick, see if you guys caught it. Anyways, but maybe you, you remember when you were a little kid and you had that one friend. And I don't know, this might have been you actually. But you had the friend that seemed like they had everything, right? They had all the cool toys. They had all the cool gadgets. Maybe in today's day, they had like the, the, the latest gaming device with the, the coolest video games. I remember when we were growing up, we were still living in Southern Oregon in the town of Ashland, Oregon. And there was a family that was a part of our church. I think they were a part of our church. They were named the Grantlands. Did they come to the, yeah, they came to the Ashland Foursquare Church. And I believe that dad was a doctor, a lawyer, even better, right? Come on, show me the Benjamins. Anyways. So he, he, they were doing pretty good financially. And I remember every time going over there that they had this room. It was a toy room. And being able to go there and be like, oh my goodness, this is Disneyland. This is like the best place ever, right? And I don't know if you can remember, but it, during like the mid, early 80s, this was probably about the same time frame, like Star Wars was big. Anybody remember Star Wars? All of you guys have been living under the, the rock at all. But they had, I mean, I remember like our parents, like we get the action figures, right? I mean, you have the action figure, Han Solo, you know, Darth Vader, all the different guys that you can get. We would go to their house and they had like all the action figures, but they just didn't have that. They actually had the Millennium Falcon. Can you believe, 
The male- I mean, that thing was like 50 bucks and they had it, right? They not only had that, but they had almost everything else, all the different, the, the X-Wing, and I can't even remember all the different spaceships that they had, but they had all the different toys. And I remember always wanting to go over there and play with their toys because they had everything. And I don't know if, if you can remember, maybe you had a friend like that where they had all the cool toys and I was like, mom, let me go over to so-and-so's house, right? because we wanted to play with what they had. They had all the cool gadgets, all the cool things. Maybe in high school, they had the cool ride and you were like, you know, just in like, I had a a 79 Cadillac. (laughs) Ragtop, black, leather seats. I mean, back in 79, it was the ride, but in 98, Not so much, but it was fun because everyone liked to ride because I could fit everyone in my car, but, and gas was cheap back then. But, but they, you know, the people that had the ride is like always wanted to go to their house or always wanted to go and ride in their car. And, and whether uh, knowingly or maybe even unknowingly, you started to see something take place in your own life. You started to see that I wanted to go hang out with these people, not necessarily because I wanted to be their friends, but I, I wanted to, to know them so that I could play with their stuff. I could get in their ride and look cool, or I could play with those toys. And we can have that kind of attitude growing up with other things as well. And I think sometimes that that, that attitude, that, that um, same mindset can kind of creep into our Christian life as well. And I think that sometimes that that has a part to play in the Christian culture of church today. When we focus and talk about the Holy Spirit and we see all the different books that are written and the different conferences that take place that, that more often than not, what, what is the, the detail, what is the, the thing that we are trying to focus on is not necessarily the person of the Holy Spirit, but more about the works and his power of thinking, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? How can I be able to do more of this? How can I have the greatest gadgets and so forth and so on? But in actuality, are we really making the time to know his person? Are we listening to teachings or trying to dive into the word of God to understand who he is as a person and not only what he can do for us? And I think that is what the Holy Spirit has kind of led me to talk on this morning is on the person of the Holy Spirit. Because I think it's when we can fully understand who he is as a person, we'll eventually discover his presence and his power. But it needs to start with knowing him as a person. That if we don't know the person of the Holy Spirit, we won't have the foundation and the authority to be able to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so I want us to be able to know and understand because it's so easy for us to think of the Holy Spirit as an it. That he's just a force. That he's just an influence. Not necessarily the, the, a part of the Godhead, kind of. I mean, he's talked about as, as, as a dove. He ascended on Jesus in Jesus' baptism as a dove, but he's not a dove, right? He's like the wind, but he's not wind. That he's like fire, but he's not fire. He's not some object, impersonal force. Because even Jesus was given the name, the Lamb of God, but he wasn't a lamb. That it was symbolic, kind of pointing to who Jesus was and what he was going to do in his life as that perfect sacrifice. Same with the Holy Spirit, that that there's been different symbols used in the word of God to kind of describe who the Holy Spirit is, but that's not who he is. That he is a person, amen? That we can seem that it's the force just like in Star Wars. And only the super spiritual Jedis. Ethan, remember Star Wars, right bud? can only have the force, but you have to control it because otherwise, if you don't control it, then you're going to turn super weird, right? And become someone that's, that's too far off thinking of the Holy Spirit and become one of those weird Christian people, right? No? Okay. Becoming on the dark side. Never mind. Maybe you guys don't, haven't run into any of those people, or maybe I'm that person you guys like. I think he's talking about himself here. Anyways. (laughs) 
But we like to talk about all that he can do for us without introducing who he is. And so this morning, I want us to be able to look at some characteristics of the Holy Spirit in the beginning, kind of break down some, some basic Christianity, some basic doctrine for us on understanding who the Holy Spirit is. Again, the quote that we read last week is, um, he who does not know God, the Holy Spirit, cannot know God at all. This was an 18th century theologian um, by the name of Thomas Arnold, not to be confused with Tom Arnold. For those of you guys who know Roseanne Barr's ex-husband, no, not him. Thomas, it makes it more theological. Thomas Arnold said that quote, he said, he who does not know God, the Holy Spirit, cannot know God at all. And that is something that we need to know and understand that as we get to know God, the Holy Spirit, that we're going to be able to know God, the Trinity, the Godhead, the fullness of who God is, to be able to understand and walk in that. One of the things that I think that we can struggle with is the question that I've already said is, how can I have more of the Holy Spirit, right? But as we rethink and go back into kind of looking at the Bible and understanding doctrine, we can go from the mindset of how can I get more of the Holy Spirit to actually thinking properly is how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? And that is what I want us to understand and for us to dive into is not how much I can get more of him, but how he can have more of my life. John the Baptist says it the best, and I know that many of you guys know it, when, when Jesus came is, 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 is he would increase and I would decrease so that we need to know and understand that there needs to be some some decrease in my own life to be able to walk in the fullness that the holy spirit has for me so i just want to to talk a little bit about what makes a person a person okay there's three distinct characteristics that make a person a person or the three characteristics of personhood if you've taken basic doctrine you might know this what are the three anybody know Mind, will, and emotions, right? The mind, will, and emotions. So this is not for women to say about your husband. He's not a person then if he doesn't have all three. He doesn't have a mind. He doesn't, like, I don't know about his will. His emotions are just, all right. That one crashed. I won't use that one again. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we'll try it next time. Maybe next time, Lynn, huh? Okay, Maybe. So first, let's look at the will. 1 Corinthians 12. So if you want to turn your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be just looking at two verses. We're going to go sword drills this morning because we need to know our Bibles, right? I know sometimes I might have made you just, just uh, a little bit lazy and just, oh, it's going to be up on the screen. I don't even bring my Bible this morning. But I just want in this, in this portion of, of the message this morning, just for us to open up our Bibles. 1 Corinthians, it's in the New Testament it's a, and it's in the letters that Paul wrote. So again, we're talking about the mind, will, and emotions, the three basic characteristics of personhood. And maybe if you have your pen, you could write proof of the Holy Spirit's person. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll turn it as well. Verse 4, and then we're going to skip down to verse 11. It says, There are diversities of gifts but the same spirit moving down, which it starts talking about the lifts of spiritual gifts. And verse 11, it says, but one in the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually. So what we see here is that he has a will, right? He's the one who distributes. He has a will. He's the one that makes the decisions on who gets the certain spiritual gifts inside of a church, that it's his will. If he's just an impersonal force or just an influence, he doesn't have a will. He can't make decisions, all right? Is this, is this going to be too simple for us this morning? I just want us to make sure because we need to know this. We need to understand this. So we just see that the Holy Spirit has a will, that he can make decisions. He has the ability to make decisions. Next is the mind, Romans 8, verses 26 through 27.
It says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So this scripture we see that he has a mind. That there is a mind. So he cannot, he not only has a will and is able to make decisions, but he has a mind and is able to intercede for us. So he's not an impersonal force. He's not just an influence. He's able to intercede for us as believers. Passage only makes sense if the Holy Spirit is a person. Last one we're going to look at before we kind of get into the rest of the message is emotions. Emotions. Ephesians 4. 30. Ephesians 4 30 says, <clears throat> excuse me, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we see that there is grief, that he can be grieved. Grief is an emotion. So he can feel, right? So we see that he has a mind, he has a will, and he has an emotion, that he is the Holy Spirit. So why do I take time to point out the person of the Holy Spirit for us? Who may already know, or maybe it's like, what's, what's the big deal of, about him being a person? Because if we don't understand and see the Holy Spirit as a person, we will lose out on all that God has for us through the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. If we do not really understand that and have that in our mind, that he is a person, that he is a real person who resides with us. Last week we learned that he dwells inside of us, amen? That as we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that he sends the helper, the paraclete, the one who's come alongside to be there, an advocate for us, that he's dwelling inside each and every one of us. But if we don't understand him as a person, then we'll lose out on one of the most important things about our Christianity and about our faith, and that is the communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, again, the first scripture that we read at the beginning says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. This is the second letter written by Paul the Apostle to the church of Corinth. Um, if you kind of studied out, there's possibly four letters that were written by the Apostle Paul. Two of them haven't been found ever. And so this second letter, if that is true, would be the fourth letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth. And what he does, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he writes this letter to him, is that he breaks down the simpli in, a simplicit, in, in a simple way the Trinity. He breaks down it so simple and so beautifully for each and every one of us that, that we don't, don't really see it and we can kind of pass over it if we're just reading through it, maybe in a daily reading plan. But it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And I want us to see and understand this. this is three distinct elements to our faith and our walk with God. That there is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where would we be without the grace of Jesus? It is by grace that you have been saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Where would we be without the grace of Jesus? Getting something that we don't deserve that we have been able to receive salvation not because of anything I've done or said or my actions. It's only through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next it says the love of God. The love of God the Father. The Bible says, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So it actually initiated with the love of the Father. Because he so loved the world. He so loved you and I that he gave, that he initiated the process of salvation so that we can receive grace. And then he says the communion 
or fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's not like taking bread and, and, the, and the grape juice that we do, not that type of communion, but it's the fellowship. Communion with the Holy Spirit. Grace comes through Jesus, love comes from the Father, and relationship comes through the Holy Spirit. Another way of saying it, breaking it down a little bit, because we're gonna, I'm gonna try, what I'm gonna try and do as we go through this message is be able to see different parts and aspects of the Trinity for all of us because I know it's something that is so hard for us to understand, right? How can God be one but yet three persons? How can he be talked about in the Bible but in, in, as one but also we are able to see him in three distinct ways throughout the, the different dispensations of the Godhead? And so I want us to, to see as we kind of continue going on, talking specifically about the Holy Spirit, that we would continue to grow and understand in the Trinity and the Godhead. So the first thing that we need to see is that the Father initiated the process of salvation. The Son carried out the act. And the Holy Spirit applies it to humanity. That the Holy Spirit is the one that brings about salvation, sanctification. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. The sanctifying work, the cleansing work of us. But I want us to focus on that word communion here this morning. Because like I said, it's not the communion that we take, the Lord's Supper. The Greek word is koinonia. Koinonia, if you want to know, maybe you've heard this before. But it means fellowship, association, Community, joint participation. It's the same word used describing what took place in the book of Acts in, in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, 42 says in the New Living, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Fellowship, community, participation. Koinonia was a large part of of the early church. Mm -hmm. Another word that kind of is an overall meaning of this word koinonia is participation. That it's a participation taking place, all right? So if we want to read 2 Corinthians 13, 14 and kind of switch out that word communion in my text, other people's Bibles, translation, they may have said fellowship, but we can say, and the partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And that, I believe, needs to make sense in our lives. That this is a partnership that the Holy Spirit has been sent to come alongside and to be with you. And for us to really understand a partnership, it's hard to understand a partnership if it's just an impersonal force. If it's just an influence. If, this is, if he is an it. If it's just something that can come and go and you can't really control and it's all about me trying to control this force. But when in actuality, when we understand that he is a person that we can relate to him more and that we can be in participation with him more. It's something that if you read in the gospels, it's something that took place in Jesus' life. Whenever Jesus we see in the gospel was doing something that it was in partnership with the Holy Spirit. All the way back to the birth. That the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, right? That that took participation. That she had to open herself up and say, okay, whatever God's will. So that there was a partnership also with Mary for this virgin birth. For the birth of our Savior. Fully God, fully man. But we also see that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness that he was empowered by the Spirit, that he walked hand in hand with the Spirit. Whenever he cast out demons, it was with the Holy Spirit. When he caused the blind to see, it was with the Holy Spirit. When he told the lame to walk, it was with the Holy Spirit. Even his resurrection was in participation with the Holy Spirit. And we know and understand that Jesus came to bring about salvation for each and every one of us, that we could be forgiven, but he also came to show us a new way of life. And that is living in partnership with the Holy Spirit. That this Christian life is not about just saying a prayer and mm, I got that done with, I'm going to heaven, so let me just keep living my life like I used to. No, it's about living this new life that Jesus demonstrated for each and every one of us. That there's a part partnership 
going on with the Holy Spirit that needs to take place, that there's a communion, that koinonia going further, that there's a joint participation and a partnership taking place. So this morning, I just want to bring three points this morning for us to kind of focus about and realize this partnership. And the first one is so easy. It's so simple. It's making time for him. Are we making time for the Holy Spirit? To be able to have relationship, to be able to have a partnership, to be able to have community and fellowship taking place, there needs to be a making time for him. Making time for him. This begins with an awareness. Are we aware that he is with us? Are we making time to be aware that he is with us. Once that awareness continues to grow and continues to build, then all of a sudden we'll have an attention for him. Awareness grows into attention. And once attention, once we start giving him attention in this relationship, making time for him, then an affection will grow. Awareness leads to attention, leads to affection. Are we making time? Are we growing an awareness for the Holy Spirit in our lives? Again, he's a person that we need to know and understand, amen? And if we want the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand the person of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if maybe you guys were in, 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 uh, in junior high. Remember junior high years, like the the... the the emotions and everything was going on and whether you're a guy or girl, all of a sudden you notice someone and you're like, hey, holla. You guys aren't doing that. It sounds like Crystal was. But anyways. <laughs> but all of a sudden there was an awareness of something. You're like, oh, who are they? Or man, you come back from summer. Whoa, hey, how you doing? And all of a sudden, you know, you became aware, continually aware. And then all of a sudden, they, they always got your attention every time they walk through. And you're like, oh, there they are. And then as you gave your attention to them, that affection started to grow. Whether you talked to them or you didn't talk to them, all of a sudden, you know, you almost had like a, a soul tie formed. And you're just like looking at them, right? And then all of a sudden, you realized, hey, I'm 13, 14 years old. I still live with my mom, still share a room with my sibling. I don't have a car. I don't have a job. What am I doing? Let me focus on my education. Right? Remember that? You know, you didn't think of that. You want to know why? Because you weren't listening to the Holy Spirit. Because he would have told you to do that. But are you aware of the Holy Spirit? Are you making time for the Holy Spirit? To be able to become aware. Again, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I know when we read that verse, it's like, yeah, come on, the grace, I need more grace. I want grace in my life, amen? Love of God, yes, bring it on. I want more of the love of God the Father in my life. Communion of the Holy Spirit, ooh, communion means time. Oh, I gotta make time. I'm already busy as it is. Sometimes that's the thing that gets overlooked. We love grace. We love talking about grace. We love the love. I mean, love, love. I mean, what's not to love about love? Love is good. I need more of it. Huh? All you need is love. Thanks, babe. Thanks for bringing that worldly music into this house. <laughs> I play it. Phyllis, I'm sorry if you're listening. That's my mother-in-law's name. Anyways. But making time, are we making time? I know there's an old adage, time plus words equal intimacy. Are we making time for the Holy Spirit to be able to build and grow that communion, that fellowship, that relationship, that partnership? Because we need to know and understand that we can't do life, this Christian life, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from his person, his presence, and his power. But it begins with his person. Amen? Amen. Next after an awareness that there needs to be an obedience. Obedience builds relationship. John 14, 15 through 16 says, if you love me, Jesus, Jesus, this is the scripture we talked, we used last week, but we're picking up one more verse before 
We, we did 16 through 17. So John 15 through 16 says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. That this is remember the helper, the paraclete, the one that's been sent to come alongside and bring encouragement, bring comfort into our lives. But we see something that we didn't see last week. And that's why it can be tough sometimes preaching and, and using scripture's focus that you can take out of context. Because what we see here is actually there's an obligation, that there's a stipulation to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life. And that is, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And that's not just a love that we have to produce out of ourselves because the Bible says that it, we can love because he first loved us, right? And so it's out of that love that we've experienced that can't be explained that all of a sudden we've come into this relationship and, and have discovered that I can be forgiven, that I can have a relationship with God and be able to sense and feel his presence and his love and his joy and find out that I'm chosen and, and accepted, that all of a sudden that something starts to change in my heart and I can... Out of that love, I can obey him, that I can follow his commandments. But we need to know that obedience builds relationship. Obedience builds relationship. And I don't know how many of you guys have had a long relationship. It doesn't, I'm not talking specifically about a marriage or a couple or anything like that. I'm talking about maybe you've had long-term friends way back from high school or even maybe before that you've kept in contact with and it's still a good relationship, or maybe a sibling, a close sibling, or a cousin, whatever it might be, that through the years you've understood them, and they've understood you, you know what they like, you know their favorite things, you know what they like to go and do, that you have a closeness, that there's a relationship there with you, that you almost know them better than you know themselves, but in knowing that, all the good things that they like, you also know what kind of agitates them. You know what irritates them. You know what causes them to kind of like get a little pushed back by certain things that are said or certain things that are done. And that is the same with the Holy Spirit. That you wouldn't say something that one of your, maybe, maybe you have a close sibling, you wouldn't say something mean to them because you knew that would bring separation. That's an obedience in relationship. But we're not gonna cross this line in our relationship. Same with the Holy Spirit. Because in Ephesians 4.30, we read it already. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He has emotions. He can be grieved. And he grieves when we are disobedient. When there's disobedience in our lives, that there's a separation that can take place and, and push us away from him. Obedience builds relationship. Being obedient to God and his word builds relationship with the Holy Spirit. Another quote I read earlier, or read earlier this week, it says, your relationship can't go higher than your obedience to the Holy Spirit. Your relationship can't go higher than your obedience to the Holy Spirit. That it's out of that relationship, if we want to continually build our relationship with him, there needs to be further obedience to him and to his word. Amen? That we can grieve the Holy Spirit by being disobedient. And what that actually talks about is actually allowing sin, maybe a sin back into our life from an old pattern. And as we allow that to kind of take up root back in our lives, that it not only grieves them because we're walking in sin, but there's a separation that takes place. And conversely, we're choosing sin and we're pushing him away in our lives, even though he's still with us. That is saying, I don't really want you. I'd rather have this. Same with the relationship that we have with people because he's a person. He can be grieved. He has emotions. So what is the decisions that we are making with our life, in our actions, in our marriage, in our relationships, the way we do life? Is it in obedience or disobedience to God's word? That is something that builds relationships and it takes risk to walk in obedience. It takes risk because to walk in obedience to God, to his word, to the Holy Spirit, that means pushing some things away. And that's a risk sometimes because sometimes where we need to walk away in some areas or maybe walking away from a bad relationship. Maybe it's walking away from something that we're currently doing. And that's a risk we have to take to walk in obedience. 
because the reward is relationship. Without risk, there'll be no relationship. And there'll be no reward that God has for us. No risk, no reward, no relationship. Finally, we're going through this early today. Praise the Lord. Not praise the Lord because it's long. <sighs> Got the hecklers in the back. <laughs> Wally, you were sitting up here front row a couple weeks ago. What happened? Slide into the back. I'm just fighting off. Finally, it's knowing he's with you. Knowing he's with you. Knowing he's with you even when you make a mistake. Not if, but when, actually. Knowing he's with you when you make a mistake. Look at Romans 8, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit knows our tendencies. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our failures. He knows everything about us. And he still made a choice, made a decision to be with us, to come alongside us, to help us. He knows that. He knows that we're going to mess up, that we might fall back into an old pattern of lifestyle again, that we might fall back into something and make a bad choice. He knows that, but what he doesn't really know and he doesn't really understand is when that takes place. We stay separate from him. We don't go and ask forgiveness or ask for his help that we try and pick ourselves back up and we just keep trying to do life by ourselves and keep moving forward. Sure, there may come a time or a day or a series of days where we're not making time for him. We're not in the word. We're not in the prayer. We're not asking him how to direct our lives. God, what are you trying to say through your word? but he doesn't understand when we keep on down that road. When we allow sin in our life and allow ourselves to just keep walking in shame, walking in pain, he doesn't understand why we continually make that choice because he's waiting for us. Proverbs 24, 16 in the New Living says, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get back up again. The key that we need to understand with the Holy Spirit, we can bounce back. That we can get back up again. It's not once we've made a mistake, we just kind of keep on down that path because, oh, God's angry with me. No, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with you, to help you. You're not going to live perfect. We're trying to live perfect, but you're not going to make every decision right. That's why he's called the helper to help us to comfort us. Why? Because we're going to make, a, make mistakes. We're going to be in pain so that he can be there to comfort us, to be with us. Are we allowing our minds to know that he is a person, that he is with us, that he is alongside of us? The Holy Spirit is a person who speaks to our person. He speaks to our frailties. He speaks to our weaknesses. He brings life where there once was death. He brings a calm where there may be a chaos. And he can bring hope where there once was despair or there might be despair in your life right now that he can bring hope. But are you turning to him or are you just trying to do things on your own? He doesn't just come as a force. He comes in a real and personal way. In Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, Man ate of the forbidden fruit. Brought sin into the world. But God came down like times before, knowing full and well what had taken place. Adam, where are you? He still came at the same time, the same place. He wanted to meet with Adam knowing full and well the sin that he did, the disobedience that took place. And he still wanted to meet with him. But what did Adam do? He went and hid. 
God still wants to meet with you, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have allowed back into your life. He wants to be there with you, and he wants to be able to bring about a repentance and a forgiveness so that you can stand back up again and keep moving forward. That is the desire that God has for each and every one of us. That is what Holy Spirit has been sent for each and every one of us, that even though we fall, even though we make mistake, which we will, that we could ask for help and we can stand back up again. Someone once said that no man drowns falling into water. It's only when we stay there. Are we asking for help to get back up? To be able to move forward with the power of the Holy Spirit, no matter the mistakes. The Holy Spirit's person reveals his presence and his power. And it is impossible to do Christian life without him. Amen? So I want us to think about this week is when I think about the Holy Spirit, am I asking for more of him? How can I get more of him? Or how can he have more of me? The Holy Spirit loves us, amen? He loves us. He wants what's best for our lives. We can get some worship music. As we go into this song, I know we're a little early, but allow your hearts to be open for what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. We want to be able to make time for the Holy Spirit, amen? To speak to our weaknesses, to reveal certain things in our lives, to be able to have place in our services. That he would be able to do something, that he would feel a freedom but that freedom comes with a greater awareness for him, a greater attention upon him, not on who's ever speaking, not on who's ever singing, not on whatever the songs may be, but upon him. And as we have that awareness and grow in that attention, that our affections will be upon him. Not only on a Sunday morning, but also when we leave here go to work on a Monday morning when someone does something wrong to us in the workplace, when our boss skips us over for some promotion, whatever the case may be that you know that he is there with you in the workplace, he's with you in the home, he's with you wherever you have hobbies, that he is with you. Are we making time for him so that we can be led by him? That we'd understand his person and his person would his presence and his power. Let's stand. If you need prayer for anything, I want to be able to pray with you this morning. But like every morning, we want to make time for Holy Spirit to speak to us. Maybe there's something that we've grieved him in a way. Maybe there's been a distance between you and him that you once had seemed like there was a closeness before. Maybe it's not something that you said or something you did, but maybe it's inaction. Maybe it's something that you know you should be doing. Allow him to remind you. Allow this time to be like coming back with a long lost loved one or a long lost friend where there was a broken relationship and maybe that's not you. 